got to start with the soil test, okay? It's, it's, but it's always a good idea. Now, I'm not going to recommend one lab over the other. <coughs> Working with the lab for a while, and if you're doing a good job, stay with it. The thing you don't want to do is change every year because you'll get different results because of the extractions they use. But again, it really helps you pin down what's in your soil, what you might need to add to your soil, both for the short term and the long term. Um, we recommend a test every three years, and at the very least, the thing that you need to know about your soil is what that level of pH is, which of course is the soil acidity. And why it's important, again, you've seen this many, many times before, but having that pH around 6.5 is going to be optimum. And that's optimum in terms of where most of the nutrients are going to be available. Once you start getting a pH it's above seven, you'll start to see things like phosphorus and boron and a lot of the metals, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc become less available. It gets more acidic, we're looking at things like calcium and magnesium and molybdenum being less available. So again, for most of the vegetable crops, for most of the alliums, all of the alliums, garlic being one of them, we like to see a pH around 6.5, just slightly acids, and seven is going to be neutral. Just slightly acid. Not only does it have an impact on the availability of the nutrients, but it also has an impact on the soil microbial activity. And the microbes that we need to convert the organic matter over to the ammonium and over to the nitrate are really do best at that pH that's near neutral. So again, we want to keep that in mind as well. So again, not only on the fertility, but getting those nitrogen, especially getting that available to the crop, is very important. So again, ideal pH is around 6.5, but really anywhere from 6 to, to 7, just under 7 would be where we want to be with garlic. So again, that should fit the vegetables. Again, to change the pH, we're going to be adding lime. It's going to raise the pH up. Um, depending on your soil type, you're going to need more. If you want to mow your soil with more clay and more silt, you're going to need less. Of course, if you're on a sandy or a gravelly soil. So again, a soil test will be able to tell you how much limestone you're going to need. Now, typically in our areas, we worry about the pH going too low and we have to use limestone. But if you're in a situation that perhaps your pH is high and it's above seven, well then the easiest thing to do would probably be to add some sulfur. So sulfur is sort of just the opposite of what limestone would do, and that helps lower the pH. And of course, when we're talking about garlic and the alliums, Adding sulfur can be a very good thing because they have a higher amount of sulfur and one of the things that gives them some of their flavor is the sulfur compounds they've got. Uh, so again, dealing with an acid soil, the more time the limestone has to react with the soil, the better. So um, if you need to put it on, you need that soil, if you need to put a lot on, okay, it's best if you split the application, work it into the soil a couple of times. Um, in, for most vegetables, we like to see it put on in the fall, so by spring you'll be ready. Of course, with garlic, you're planting in the fall. So, again, it's something um, to think about, but you want that pH in that 6 to, to 7 range. If you need additional calcium, use a limestone that's higher, that's a calcitic limestone, it has the higher calcium. If your magnesium levels are low, and again, you're going to get that from a soil test, then you're going to be looking at a dolomitic line. So you get the results back from the lab, and you've got your phosphorus and potassium, calcium, magnesium. You might have other elements there as well, depending on what that lab tests for and what you ask to be tested for. Usually the soil pH is always there, the percent organic. And really for garlic, for phosphorus and potassium, our recommendations are pretty straightforward. It all depends on what you've got in the soil. But basically for phosphorus, depending on your soil test, Garlic uses, garlic requires a relatively high level of both phosphorus and potassium. One of the reasons is that the root system, as compared to some other vegetables, is not that great. So it's not able to get into the soil as deeply and as widely as some of the other vegetable crops. So again, that's why we're looking at up to 200 pounds per acre of actual phosphorus and potassium if the soil is very low. If your soil is very high, and for many organic growers, your nutrient levels are going to be because you've been adding compost, been adding manures to these soils, your organic matter, matter levels are up, so a lot of times your nutrient levels are up as well. You probably don't, are going to be on the lower end of what needs to be added. For phosphorus and potassium, we recommend that these nutrients be applied in the fall of the year when you're planting the garlic. We don't worry about these nutrients being leached away, as we're going to talk a lot about the potential for that happening in nitrogen. Um, 
For, so for phosphorus, because it's locked up, it's tightly bound in cold soils, even if your level of phosphorus is relatively high, sometimes <coughs> side dressing at the beginning of the season with some additional phosphorus, a soluble form of phosphorus in, 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 uh, in some water, can actually help make some of that available. As the soil warms up, phosphorus levels are going to get quite high and should be adequate for the, the crop that we've got out there. But when you're looking at the soil test results, uh, some soil test labs will give you an estimate of the nitrogen availability. Um, and that is just going to be an estimate. And that's why you don't typically see a firm number in terms of the available nitrogen that's going to be there. There's some clues that you can look at. The percent organic matter, we'll talk about that, and give you a clue as to how much nitrogen you might be getting from the organic matter in your soil. Um, and of course, nitrogen is an issue for garlic growers because as I said, we're planting in the fall, and growing through the winter, into the spring, and harvesting the following summer. So, as compared to most vegetable crops, the garlic's going to be in that field for a long period of time. Garlic's going to be in the soil at a time when it's very cold, when microbial action is very low, where nutrients might be um, slowly converted, but also at a time where if the ground's not frozen, the potential for leaching is great. And that's going to happen with nitrogen compounds. So I want to spend most of the time that I've got left talking about nitrogen in garlic. And let me just ask here up front, there's really no right answer or wrong answer. Um, for those of you that are, are planting garlic, have garlic in the ground, how many people typically put nitrogen down in the, in the fall of the year? Okay. Most are going with the spring then, the spring application? Okay. So again, something you're all familiar with, why we don't usually see nitrogen in our soil test reports is because it's constantly moving. It's moving from the organic matter in the soil, it's moving from the humus in the soil, it's moving from the soil microbes to forms that the plant can take up, which is going to be the ammonium and nitrate. And of course, once you get forms that the plant can take up, then it can lead to some other problems, and that some of that could be lost as well. So again, if we were to check our nitrate concentration in the soil today, we probably find levels well below 10 parts per million. If we did it in the middle of summer when the soil is nice and warm and the microbes have been breaking down the organic matter, our nitrate level would probably be about 30 parts per million, maybe closer to 50 or 60 parts per million. So it's constantly changing. And again, a lot of that's related to the organic matter that you've got in the soil and the type of fertilizer that you apply. So when we look at this in terms of, you know, just look a little bit more closely at the nitrogen cycle and how it relates to garlic growth. So how do the dead plants, um, microbes, organic fertilizers that you're applying in the field, how do they become available to the crop? Well, <coughs> you've got a good, healthy soil, and Georgia Bowie, of course, is going to talk more about this, but then you've got a lot of fungi, beneficial fungi, and bacteria out there, they're going to be breaking that material down. And the first thing they're going to do is they're going to convert that from the organic matter, which really cannot be picked up by the crop, no matter what crop you've got, to an ammonium form. Ammonium form is a positively charged ion, it's a cation, and that's something that can be picked up by, by crops. This is going to occur more quickly when the soil is nice and warm, when the moisture is just right. Really, conditions that are perfect for plant growth are really going to make sure that we see a quick conversion from organic matter over to available nitrogen. The amount of carbon in a plant in the, in the organic matter has a big impact as well because if it's highly carbonaceous, it's going to be slower to convert over to available nitrogen. We'll talk more about that. So now we've got the ammonium in the soil. And what happens to that? Well, because it has a positive charge, the same as a calcium or a magnesium, we don't usually worry about those elements leaching away because the soil has a negative charge. And organic matter has a negative charge. So again, they're going to attract the positive ion. So we don't really worry about the ammonium leaving our soil as we would with what it converts into, which is the nitrate. Okay. Some of that ammonium can be picked up by plants' roots. Okay. Um, the preferred form of nitrogen for most of our vegetable crops is going to have the choice of ammonium or nitrate. The preferred form is going to be nitrate easier on the plant to use the nitrate than it is ammonium, but plants can use ammonium. Okay. Some of that ammonium 
could be lost to the atmosphere. Um, if you're, if you're and it never smelled after you apply manure and you let it sit on top of the soil surface, besides a lot of maybe sulfur type of odors, you might notice the smell of ammonia coming off it. And again, that's your nitrogen that's leaving the field if you're smelling any ammonia. It's the same process. You just lose a hydrogen ion, you get something ammonia that's volatile and it's going to leave. What we hope is going to happen is most of that ammonium is going to be converted over to nitrate. And that is really, you know, people have looked at this in depth, it's really related to the temperature. So that conversion from ammonium over to nitrate is related to the temperature. And when the temperature is below 50, 45 degrees, the conversion is very slow. It's still happening. It's still going to happen up until the ground freezes, but at a very low level. And here you can see with this, we've got so the temperature is very low over here at 42 degrees, going up to about 75 degrees over here. And you can see the, the nitrification, the percent nitrification that's occurring. So again, we're starting with the same level of ammonium in this situation. When it's very cold, we see that the process is very slow. As we raise the temperature, we're getting more of that conversion, more of that conversion. So we're getting more nitrate, more nitrate being produced. Okay, if you look at this, the same sort of a thing. This is just ammonium. Uh, this was with ammonium sulfate, I believe, was applied to the soil. And what they looked at was growing or looking at the conditions when it was 45 degrees and when it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So these blue bars here will show you how much ammonium is left. This is three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, up to 18 weeks after we, we added this to the soil. We incubated it under 60 degree temperatures or 45 degree temperatures here. And you can see that three weeks later, when it's cold, we still have about 80 percent is in the ammonium. <coughs> Again, not going to leach at that point. And even you know, 12 weeks out, so three months later, more than half of it is still available as the ammonium form. So just raise the temperature up to 60 degrees, and what happens there is you can see within within six weeks, a lot of that ammonium is gone. Less than a third of it is left as ammonium. The rest of it is has gone over to nitrate. And nine weeks later, it's, it's gone, and that's at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the optimum. But this would be even higher than that. So if we got temperatures that we will see in the summer and in the spring around here that are approaching 70 degrees soil temperature in the top couple of inches, certainly that's going to happen even quicker. Okay. So again, we're seeing that conversion occur very quickly. And then this was just with um, ammonium sulfate that was added to the soil, and they looked at it 24 days after it was applied at 80 degrees, 60 degrees, and, and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see at 80 degrees in 24 days, it was all converted to nitrate. Okay. At 40 degrees, only about 30% was. But again, some of this, give it another 24 days, you probably be seeing another 30%. So it, it is happening even at these low temperatures. And that's where we have to be concerned about the potential loss of any nutrients that we're putting, nitrogen that we're putting out in the fall of the year.